Mr. Alistair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the First Minister give an assurance, particularly to innocent victims, who were greatly relieved by his U-turn on the implementation of the Maze project, that that stance will not be traded or diluted either in the Haas talks or anywhere else? Mr. Speaker, I seem to recall the member on a previous occasion having indicated that uh, the Democratic Unionist Party had already traded this issue and that was why they were taking the position that they had. Now that we have clearly shown that that is not the case, can I make it very clear to them that I wouldn't characterize the position I have adopted as being a U-turn. The Ulster Unionist Party placed the Peace Centre in the Mays complex. Uh, I have indicated that it would be unwise uh, for Northern Ireland to proceed with a peace centre which itself was going to be a cause of division uh, and that there is a necessity uh, to have a broad base of cross-community support for any such uh, project. That remains my position. Mr. Alistair. First Minister must be one of the few people who doesn't see it as a U-turn. I don't think there's any shame in that. Doing the right thing is never something to be ashamed of. But could the First Minister shed any light if the $18 million which was previously to be squandered on the maze, is not now there to be squandered there. What is the thinking about where that money might be more beneficially and usefully used? Well, Mr. Speaker, of course, uh, it will be a matter for the SEUPB to, to look at what projects can use any money that might be available. And I do understand that uh, he, he does have some sympathy for, for U-turns, because uh, this is the same member who comes in here week after week. And the man from Mars would think that he was breathing fire on Republicans, and he chides me for doing business with Republicans. But then, secretly and outside of this House, oh. the member, as the executor of a will, is selling land to Republicans in County Fermanagh oh. to benefit his own family. So it ill becomes him, it ill becomes him to order, order this house, order, beating order, his chest as if he's scoring order, to be order, 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 the member must take a seat, order, order. Order, 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 order. I must ask the member to take a seat. Order, order, order. Roy Banks, Mr. Banks. Uh, uh, about a year ago, the Office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister announced the establishment of 10 social enterprise hubs. And about a year ago, uh, social enterprise NI was established. Can the First Minister indicate to us? What conversations and discussions he has had with enterprise, social enterprise in Northern Ireland? Well, I personally haven't had any. Uh, obviously, as soon as we produce proposals that uh, have various aspects of overarching responsibility, it then becomes a, a matter for the minister and department who has the, the job of taking the project forward to deal directly with its uh, implementation. Uh, so it's probably a question that could more directly be uh, asked to the, the minister responsible. Right. Does the minister agree that social enterprise in Northern Ireland are the experts in this area with knowledge of social enterprises elsewhere within the United Kingdom and elsewhere, and why have they not been consulted to date? Well, this of course is a matter for DSD, and this is one of the difficulties we get with the topical questions. DSD, as I understand it, have already identified the locations for these uh, and will be bringing them, them forward. Uh, if the member wants to have more information, it's the DSD minister that he needs to be asking the questions to. Can I ask the First Minister uh, to provide a, a recent update on the appointments of the Alex Board in Derry, please? Mr. Uh, Speaker, in terms of uh, ILEX, there have been some controversial uh, issues in relation to the, the board uh, and of course it is important from the point of view of uh, the Office of First and Deputy First Minister that uh, this important uh, body does move forward. Uh, the, uh, 
a, a new chair and three new board members uh, were appointed to ILEX uh, back on the 16th of this month. Uh, and they have been appointed, as I understand it, for a three-year term. Uh, the, uh, Philip Flynn was appointed chair, Jerry Mullen, Henry McGarvey and Aaron McElhenney were appointed non-executive -direct directors. Uh, prior to their appointment, all appointees indicated that they had not undertaken any uh, party political uh, activity when the, within the last five years. A competition to re uh, recruit a chair of the ILEX board was undertaken in 2012. This competition did not provide a wide enough pool of candidates, therefore a further competition commenced uh, earlier this year. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for that answer. Indeed, I congratulate the new appointments to bring the necessary leadership to ALEX. Now, given them recent appointments and the need for them, uh, has the uh, Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister any indicative time frame for the appointment of the, a much needed Chief Executive? Well, I think it's wrong for us to get into the, the business of giving precise dates. Uh, I think we do recognise, indeed, uh, in the Office of First and Deputy First Minister, uh, uh, ILEX is a fairly frequent topic of conversation, uh, given the uh, particular interest that the Deputy First Minister has uh, on the, the issue. Uh, I think that uh, all I can really say to him is that we will certainly be doing it as soon as possible. There is no dragging of feet or delay on the part of OFM, DFM or its officials. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. First Minister, you have rep rep been reported as indicating the challenging nature and scope of the Haas talks. What is your expectation of the process and outcome by December? Well, I know there have been some people who have sought to uh, indicate that uh, I was overly negative in relation to the, the Haas talks. Uh, I think we need to remember, first of all, why Dr. Richard Haas uh, and Megan O'Sullivan are carrying out the facilitating role that they are. These are matters that uh, we have uh, within this chamber and uh, within our parties outside of this chamber spent many years discussing. Uh, it was a matter that uh, the Deputy First Minister and I got engaged in in relation to parades right back to the Hillsborough Castle uh, talks. Uh, and indeed, before that, uh, all parties in this chamber uh, discussed these matters but failed to reach any conclusions during the course of uh, previous negotiations. Uh, but over the last 18 months, two years, there have been intensive discussions uh, within uh, an all-party committee uh, that was uh, set up by the Deputy First Minister uh, and I, and while a wide range of issues were agreed, there were three matters that uh, had, uh, found, were found to be too difficult to reach agreement at that time. Uh, the Deputy First Minister and I committed ourselves that uh, we would set up a working group of uh, some description uh, and attempt to continue to work at these matters and try and get them resolved. So by their very nature, these are difficult issues that thus far we have been able to resolve, uh, and I don't want to be putting any undue pressure uh, on uh, Richard Haas and his uh, team by raising expectations. Uh, however, in our conversations uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Haas, it is fairly clear that uh, he is absolutely determined to uh, do what he can to facilitate uh, agreement. Uh, I'm glad to see that all of the parties that have entered those discussions have indicated that they are doing that in a positive uh, manner, uh, and I can assure that as far as this party is concerned, that's the way that we will approach those discussions. Thank you, and I thank the First Minister for that uh, comprehensive uh, answer. But, uh, First Minister, some parties have indicated that if no consensus can be found in the panel that Haas uh, will bring forward his own proposals. What is your view to that approach? Well, uh, I think particularly the Alliance Party and the SDLP seem to, to indicate that if it wasn't possible within the talks to reach an agreement, then Dr. Haas uh, should bring forward proposals himself. Uh, I wouldn't want to fetter in any way uh, how uh, the Haas talks should operate and what might happen in the event of failure, because I think we have to approach these talks on the, the basis of doing everything that we can to make them succeed. Uh, however, I think we all know 
that if we're wanting anything to stick in Northern Ireland, it's necessary for there to be agreement amongst the, the parties. And I see little advantage in Dr. Haas putting forward his view if he has been unable to get agreement for those views within the, the talks process. Though we may well find it advantageous if he sees areas uh, where there could be uh, further work carried out where he thinks it might be possible for us to, to look at in more detail uh, in an attempt to get a solution if he runs out of time. Order members, question number five has been withdrawn. Magellan McBoy. Good. Cam Colia, can I ask the First and Deputy First Minister when they will publish the new racial uh, equality strategy? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'll ask my colleague, uh, Junior Minister Jonathan Bell, to answer that question. In terms of the uh, racial equality strategy, uh, which uh, we have put a lot of work into, um, our officials have been liaising directly with the racial equality panel. Uh, and also the wider representatives of the sector. Uh, and the purpose of that was to refocus and to refine the racial equality uh, strategy. Now, following the last meeting of the racial equality panel, the draft strategy is nearing completion. Uh, we intend to commence uh, the public consultation uh, exercise as soon as possible thereafter. From August, can I thank Junior, Junior Minister Bell for his response? And can I further ask, when will the proposed crisis fund or emergency fund, as promised, in addition to the tiers one to three of the Minority Ethnic Development Fund, uh, be in place? From August. Well, in the line with the recommendations uh, from an evaluation of the Minority Ethnic Development Fund, uh, we have, as the member has indicated, uh, given an agreement in principle that there should be a crisis fund element. That crisis fund element uh, will be in addition uh, to the £1.1 million annual budget. Uh, the size of that crisis fund is currently uh, being examined. Uh, it's still to be decided. And it's envisaged that the crisis fund would be delivered by a third party. Uh, Mr. Speaker, First Minister, given there's been a number of media reports indicating that you have been critical of NAMA, can you give us your assessment of their performance to date? Well, I, I saw some headlines that would have suggested that uh, I was critical uh, of NAMA. Uh, in actual fact, uh, I think NAMA have performed according to uh, their own guidelines, uh, just exactly as one might have uh, expected, and in relation to Northern Ireland, have been very helpful uh, in that they could, at an early stage, have uh, gone for a fire sale of assets in Northern Ireland, which would have been vastly damaging uh, to uh, the uh, construction industry, particularly uh, in Northern Ireland, but also to our, our property market. Uh, my uh, complaint uh, in relation to NAMO was not about the organisation, but about the fact that banks in Northern Ireland principally, but NAMO and also the Presbyterian Mutual Society, are all holding on to very considerable assets that could be developed and therefore bring jobs to the construction industry. Uh, the, uh, the fact that they are holding on to those assets is understandable from their point of view in that they hope to maximise the uh, amount of uh, revenue that they might receive uh, from their, their sale. Uh, however, it is considerably damaging to our ability to grow our economy and to get our economy moving again. Uh, and, and that's the point I'm making. Uh, it isn't a criticism of, of NAMA. NAMA is doing exactly what one would expect uh, with their fiduciary responsibility. But I think we, we do have to recognise that the banks, NAMA and the Presbyterian Mutual, Mutual Society, holding on to assets does freeze development in Northern Ireland. Thank, thank you, and thank the First Minister for his response. But can the First Minister outline what he believes the solutions to the challenges could be? Well, I, I suppose one of the solutions is for, for instance, uh, NAMA uh, to do a little more of what they had been doing with one or two of the developments, where they actually uh, introduced some of their own funding 
in order to develop out a project. They did it with uh, an office block, or are doing it with an office block down in uh, Oxford Street area. Uh, they're doing it with a housing estate out in uh, Dundonald. Uh, and that allows them, obviously, to get a, a higher uh, revenue return for the, the asset, but ensures that development does take place. And I think if the banks would perhaps do more of that, uh, it would be helpful. The other option, of course, is that some uh, financial institutions or other organizations uh, come in buy the assets of those uh, organisations, whether it's the banks, NAM or the Presbyterian Mutual Society, and build them out. Order, members, that ends the period for topical questions.